Yeah, um, I'd say it's it's a little bit different depending on the project. Um, projects usually fall um, in in one of two categories for us. Um, one of them is is um, uh, visuals first, um, and so for a visuals first piece, we usually start with a story um, that's uh, usually just written written out, um, and there'll be lots of back and forth. Like usually, all five of us. Um, have a hand on all of the stories by the time we get to actually making them. Um, once we're agreed on, on kind of like what the story, the basics of what the story is that we want to tell, um, someone on the visual team will make a storyboard that looks just like a, like a storyboard you'd make for a film. Yeah, Sarah's got an example there, um, where we just go through beat by beat, shot by shot, and figure out exactly how we're going to tell the story um, visually. Um, and then there's some back and forth there, um, some editing, usually some edits that happen um, in the storyboard phase. Um, once once the, the storyboard is set, um, the visuals team will start building um, all of the puppets. So they'll use the storyboard as a guide for what puppets need to be built, um, what backgrounds need to be created, um, and start putting together all of the materials to make the show. Um, they'll then use those materials to make a demo video of the entire piece. Um, and they'll, they'll hand that off to sound and music, usually in chunks. So they'll make like a first, a first, the first 15 minutes of, of the piece. They'll make a video of that, hand it off to Ben and I, and we can then start working on, um, sound and music. Um, so, uh, in, in this kind of project, for sound and music, it really feels like writing a film score. Like we're really, we really have like, you know, a film and we're doing really detailed sound design and then um, creating a film score for it. Um, so once once both teams have, have a sort of demo version, a demo film version of the piece, um, we then go back and figure out how to perform it live. So for puppetry, that usually means um, figuring out a really dense choreography of like who's going to open what fader, who's going to puppet what puppet, who's going to act in what scene. Um, for music and sound, uh, it's like determining which sounds need to be separate cues so that they can line up with the puppetry. Um, it's figuring out how to orient the music so that it lines up with the puppetry. Um, and then the last phase is to bring it all together um, and get in the room together and start putting the piece on its feet. Um, and we usually learn a ton um, in that in that last stage of sort of putting all the pieces together. You know, some stuff that we thought would work is just not working and we'll have to revise it. Um, so yeah, that's that's the basics of like a visuals first piece. Um, and then um, for some for some uh, pieces that we work on, um, we start with music. Um, and so usually we have the basics of what the story is or, or what the project is um, before we start writing music. Um, and then Ben and I will go away and um, write as much music as we can for the piece and hand that off to visuals. And then visuals will create all of the, um, all the visuals to, the, to that music that already exists. Um, and then, and then sometimes there's projects that are hybrids of the two. You know, sometimes we'll write a few pieces of music and hand those off, and then they'll create a few scenes and hand those off to us to score. So it just kind of depends on the project and, and the timeline as well. Um, yeah, good question. You know, I think the closest we have to that, like something that's used every time would be the overhead projector. Um, so, Let's see if I can get you a good look. Um, so here's three overhead projectors and it has here a puppet um, on it. And then that puppet goes through the lens of the overhead projector and then up onto the screen. Um, uh, the overhead projectors are really the only thing that we use in every single show um, because the puppets, each puppet is made and just used once. So this puppet is like a puppet of the lighthouse. Um, you can see the lighthouse is made out of red paper. And then this background is made out of a film called acetate. Um, and it's only used at the first scene of the show. 
So anytime we want to go back to the lighthouse, we have to make another one. And then if we have another show, like we're going to make a totally different lighthouse. Um, and the reason that we can do that is because paper is really inexpensive. Um, so it takes a lot of time to cut all of these by hand, but it's not very expensive to make a hundred different little lighthouses. We just need a hundred pieces of paper. Um, so it's a little bit different than other puppetry companies. Yeah, where you're building bigger puppets or puppets out of more expensive materials like wood or plasticine, and then you need to use them over and over. Um, but we do a lot of recycling. So all of these overhead projectors used to be used in classrooms and in schools. And then, excuse our messy studio. This is um, the oh, set okay. from um, the Christmas Carol. Um, but you can see all the way back there, we have a slide projector. Um, that also was something that somebody gave to us when they, they didn't have any more slides. Um, it's an old piece of technology. So we take a lot of these old pieces of technology that people don't use anymore and figure out how to use them to make um, cinematic images in our shows. Yeah, I think it's I think that's tricky, um, and it's it's case by case. You know, it's so hard to it's so hard to say like we always do it this way or, or this is always um, what happens in that in that case. I do think it's a strength of the company that we all come at making work from very different perspectives. Uh, like we all have very different backgrounds and very different aesthetics, and I think um, a finished piece of ours is really a huge negotiation. Um, between all of those different aesthetics and backgrounds. Um, so it can be challenging at times for sure, but I do think that the, the work benefits from, from all of our disparate uh, backgrounds and approaches. Um, yeah, and I feel like unlike more like improvisational or devised theater, um, we figure out a lot of story stuff before time. Um, so it's a lot more like, um, Sometimes it feels like we're making a movie and then we figure out how to stage it live. So um, yeah, like Kyle said, the storyboards are incredibly important. Um, so this is from the Christmas Carol. Um, these are examples of um, illustrated puppets. Um, but you know, every show we storyboard it out like a film. So like every single shot in the show um, is storyboarded. Um, we do leave a little bit of space for scenes that have live actors in them so that the actors can come up with things on their own. Um, but the storyboards are very thorough and that allows both the visual team and the sound and music team to see, okay, where's the weight of the storytelling? What are we spending a lot of time on? What is the arc? Um, and it really determines a lot of the, the pacing and the, and the content of the show and lets us talk about it before we need to go away and make like six or 700 puppets. Um, but even with the storyboards and then like Kyle said, we tend to make demos where we, you know, do the puppets really quickly and just stitch them together and show it to each other. Um, but even with the demos and the storyboards, um, yeah, like Kyle said, when we get into the theater and we put it on stage, we'll put it in front of the audience and really see what it's doing. And that's when we need to start negotiating and making changes. Um, because I might want the story to be doing something, but when I put it up on stage, I see what it's actually doing um, and what the audience's engagement with it is. And then we need to um, start either making changes or strengthening it so that um, the, the story is clear to the audience and that they go on an emotional journey with us. Um, yeah, uh, we do that all the time. Uh, all of our shows, I would say, um, have been changed usually around three times. Um, uh, I feel like that's sometimes the magic number, but we'll usually premiere a version of the show, see what, yeah, see what directions it's taking the audience in. Then we'll come back into the studio and start making changes. Maybe we'll do new storyboards. Maybe we'll do new edits to the music. Uh, maybe we'll just take out whole sections and put new sections in um, and then we'll premiere it again. Um, so for instance, the show that you saw in Edinburgh, um, Frankenstein, we made one version of that um, for Chicago 
we changed it in previews to a second version and we performed that in Chicago and New York. And then we changed it again substantially before we brought it to Scotland. And now that's the version we're touring. So it took us a couple of times to figure out what really the, the heart of the show was. Um, and that it's also true of uh, Ada Ava, which is um, the image I have behind me is from the opening of Ada Ava. That is our show that has toured around the world the most. Mm -hmm. um, and for the first several years of the show, you know, we performed a version of it that didn't have some very important flashbacks and dream sequences in it. Mm -hmm. um, and we put those in when we had the chance to premiere it in New York. So we'd already been performing the show around Chicago and, and making, you know, we had already made a few different versions of it. And then we uh, went back in and said, okay, what are some important pieces that we can put in to make the story really understandable and to make sure that the character's journey is clear to um, any audience member wherever we may take the show. Yeah, I'll, um, I feel like it's, it's really easy in our medium because there aren't any words most of the time for the audience to just get like completely wrong what we're trying to mm -hmm. say. Um, I think it doesn't happen so much anymore just because we've, we've made so much of this work. We kind of know, um, we, we kind of know what's gonna be misunderstood by the audience. But I know that early on, um, we were working on a piece called the Ballad of, or not the Ballad of Lula Del Rey, just Lula Del Rey. Um, and there, I, during one version of the show, there was like a, a satellite that was featured um, prevalently. And there was a shot where she, where Lula was, was traveling to a city and there was like, uh, what we thought of was like a distant satellite um, kind of fading into the distance beyond the city. And um, after the show, we, uh, so uh, one thing that we do after all of our shows is invite the audience up on stage with us um, so that they can get a closer look at some of the stuff that we use to make the show and ask us any questions we have. And um, we can ask them questions about just like what they took away from the show. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a really useful practice over the years. Uh, and, we, and we're doing that for this version of the show. And I remember getting some audience feedback that was just like, yeah, so what was with, like, what was with that bomb that hit the city? Like, what was, like, that was weird when that happened. Um, and so it was just a moment of like, oh yeah, this is totally not reading in the way that we, we thought it was. Um, and if you don't have, you know, words and dialogue to explain what's happening in the story, um, the audience can just like totally miss something and go on a different, you know, the, like then the story is completely different for that audience member. So I feel like we, we do have to be really careful um, to make sure we're taking the audience with us and that they're, they're headed in the same direction that, that we are. Um, so I feel like for us, it's usually just a lot of like putting something up in front of an audience and then hearing from the audience what they took from it and then making adjustments. Um, and that's kind of what led us to what, what Sarah talked about, a really iterative process where, you know, we make a full version of the show, put it up in front of an audience, get a bunch of feedback, um, and just like have lots of ideas about what's working and what isn't. And then when we have the chance, go back into the show, you know, make a bunch of changes. Um, and, you know, two or three times later, we'll have a show that, that we feel is finished. It's a good question. I feel like um, something that's usually pretty unifying for us is um, just the, the story that we're trying to tell. And just making sure that all the all the different elements are are creating something greater than than themselves. Um, so like the music has to always be making the visuals better, and the visuals have to always be making the the music better. So trying to create that that sort of co special coming together that uh, creates an emotional experience for the audience. Um, so uh, that, and, and I, I think in a process way, um, story is usually pretty unifying for us. Like all of the, all of the different elements are kind of working together to, to tell um, a pretty detailed story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's really true. Cause 
Uh, I do a lot of like the choreography for the visual team. Um, so sometimes I'll put in a show like like a, a chase sequence or um, uh, like a like a like a, a car chase or um, a, a training montage, a scene where you see the scientists getting ready in the laboratory that I think will be really fun. Um, but usually we'll discover, oh, even though this is fun and spectacular, it doesn't forward the story. So even if it's got some of the like most exciting puppets, we'll still cut it because it's always more important um, that the like audience can follow the story and go on an emotional journey more than say like indulging in puppetry that like, or, uh, or stunt work that I think might be like really fun to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean um, we just work with super, super talented people. And um, we, are, we, have, we have a full-time um, stage manager who um, tour, goes on most of the tours with the company who is part of her job is, is like quality control and just like making sure that everybody knows what, what the show is aiming to be and that the show doesn't sort of like change too much between different cast members. So part of her job is just like making sure the show is always the show um, and checking in with us when, you know, maybe someone makes a, a different decision about how to play a character um, or something like that. Um, so that we're aware of it, we can make a change, but um, yeah, I, I think it's something that, that all, that all companies that tour, um, struggle with, and we just try to invest in really talented people and, um, keep them in the company for as long as possible. And that's, we, it hasn't really ever been a, a serious problem for us. Sometimes they're better at it. Like we, we cast mm -hmm. like extraordinary, like actor puppeteers. And you know, when I'm doing a show, I'm also thinking about the choreography and the direction and like, does everybody have their contracts? You know, I'm like thinking about a million things. And when I cast a performer in a role, you know, they're, they're just working on that role, you know, and they're, they can, you know, outside of the studio, outside of rehearsals, they're working it and working it and working the characters. And I might have to do six other manual cinema things. Um, so I feel like, yeah, it's sometimes it's great actually to cast other people in roles that we started and they make it deeper and bigger and, and richer than um, like when I performed it. <laughs> yeah, and we try to keep that in mind whenever we're making a show. So because we're working in silhouette and because we're working without words, um, there is more room for the audience, for their imaginations, but we're also asking them to do more work. Um, you know, they need to like work to put together the pieces of the story. Um, you know, so for instance, I might, um, this is a, from Ada Ava, and when we want to establish that the sisters our twins that have grown up together, we do a sequence where we go over the wall and show pictures of them together throughout their whole lives. Um, and we, you know, we cut to close ups of these pictures so that people really look at them and see that they're important. But it's up to um, the audience to put those images together in their brain and say, oh, they must be twins. We, I've seen them together as babies. Um, as young girls, as adults, and they're always identical and they're always right next to each other. Um, and so, so since the audience is doing this work, um, I think that, you know, they become more invested in the character so that when one of the character dies, it hits them harder because they've kind of put themselves and their brain and their hearts into figuring out who this character is. Um, but it also, we try not to make our shows too long because <laughs> It is a lot of work for the audience. Um, so yeah, so it's, there's two sides to the coin. One, I like that it leaves room for them. Um, and two, we wanna respect that it is more work. Um, but I, I do think that this space for the audience's imagination is one reason why our shows tour so well around the globe. Um, because Ada Ava especially, that's the show we perform the most and we've performed it in Iran and in China and in all over the US and in Europe. And everywhere we perform it, somebody says, oh, that reminds me of my grandmother or, oh, I've 
I lost a sister or I, I lost a daughter and I remember those feelings of grief. So everybody, even though people are, are very different and have gone on very different life journeys, they all recognize a small part of themselves in the journey of that show. And I think it is because the silhouettes leave space for their imagination. I guess I would say just like try to make, make work with what you have um, and don't try not to get too discouraged by the fact that, that you, you, you can't have an audience. Um, there, there's plenty of ways to perform online uh, to, to figure that out. Uh, I think that's been like a big part of our, our past year. It sounds like it's been a big part of your past year. So um, I think any, anyone can do it, you know, anyone can, can make performances for online. Uh, and, and I hope that, um, I hope that that kind of takes off and sticks, you know, I don't yeah. know. Um, and yeah, for them to think about um, uh, how their audience is experiencing their show. Um, so how it is very different to experience a show in a theater versus um, uh, to watch a movie on your TV versus to watch a manual cinema show on your computer. Um, even because like we're used to working with cameras and screens. And even with that, it's different to be to say, okay, this show, people are going to be watching it in their computers and on their TVs, and no one will be in the same room together. Um, so that when we're making the show, we try to think about that, think about where our audience is, how they're feeling, and what type of screen they're watching it on. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say for theater students, like this is a great time to experiment with like a very new way of being in relationship to your audience.